Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for the webinar, What's New with Minimum Dietary Diversity for Women, Discussing Methods for Data Collection and Updated Measurement Guidance. My name is Riley Auer, and I'm the Communications Coordinator for the Data for Nutrition Community of Practice. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. All microphones are going to be muted during the presentations. Please use the chat box on your screen to connect with other participants or to connect with me for logistical support. Please share any questions you have for our speakers using the Q&A feature, and if possible, indicate who you're directing your question to. We will answer as many questions as possible live, and we'll share answers to all of the questions, as well as copies of the presentations in the community event page one week after the webinar. A recording of today's webinar will be immediately available on the Data for Nutrition YouTube channel. If you are still experiencing technical difficulties, you can exit the webinar, open a new browser, and re-enter the webinar link, and then run the setup wizard. You can also connect with me using the chat panel, and I will do my best to assist you. Today's esteemed speakers are from FAO's Minimum Dietary Diversity for Women project. They include Dr. Maria Antonio Tuazon, the lead technical officer for the MDDW project, and her colleagues, Dr. Isabella Satamini and Ms. Alexandra Tong of FAO's Food and Nutrition Division. We are also joined by Dr. Pamela Marinda, the, of, the food, of the Department of Food Science and Nutrition at the University of Zambia. Dr. Marinda is the principal investigator of the MDDW project within the focus country of Zambia. And her colleague, Dr. Dil or Mr. Dilnasal Zerfu, is a researcher at the Ethiopian Public Health Institute. Mr. Zerfu is a principal investigator of the FAO's MDDW project in the focus country of Ethiopia. Today's webinar is hosted by the Data for Nutrition Community of Practice. Data for Nutrition provides members with opportunities to share knowledge, experience, and questions relevant to strengthening the nutrition data value chain at all levels for the purpose of achieving better nutritional outcomes in low and middle income countries. We are proud to say we have 760 members and we're still growing. Today's Q&A will be moderated by Dr. Carl Lachat. Dr. Lachat is a member of the FAO MDDW project team and an associate professor in the Department of Food Technology, Safety, and Health at Ghent University, Belgium. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Tuazon to share an overview of the FAO MDDW project. Dr. Tuazon, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Rice, uh, Riley. A pleasant morning, afternoon, or evening to all. Firstly, on behalf of the MDDW team from FAO headquarters and partners, we would like to thank all of you who have joined us for today's webinar and to the Data for Nutrition team, specifically Riley, who have made this webinar possible. First slide, please. First slide. I am sure most, if not all of you are familiar with the Minimum Dietary Diversity for Women of Reproductive Age or MDDW for short. But allow me to remind everybody that it is an indicator that measures the proportion of women of reproductive age, in other words, from 15 to 49 years of age, who have consumed at least five out of the 10 defined food groups the previous day or night. MDDW is a proxy dichotomous indicator developed to reflect dietary diversity and micronutrient adequacy of the diets and applied at population level. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Since the launch of the indicator in 2015, a lot of progress has been made, particularly in terms of its uptake. In 2018, we started our inventory of countries which have collected MDDW and for what purpose? Purpose Shown in this map is our latest stock take just a week ago. And our latest count to date is that there are 55 countries which have collected or plan to collect MDDW. Of these, 11 countries are collecting MDDW as part of national surveys. 44 countries are doing it as part of impact evaluation. 
and uh, there are 12 countries planning to collect uh, MDDW. I also want to inform the group that WFP and IFAD have included MDDW as part of their suite of indicators. CADAP has included it as part of their MNE indicators. And uh, with DHS and the Global Diet Quality Project now including MDDW, we will see the numbers increase up to probably threefold in the foreseeable future. Next slide, please. With the increasing number of users, we were constantly requested to provide technical guidance on various aspects of MDD, uh, MDDW collection, analysis, and interpretation. Most commonly research quest, raised question is, which is the best dietary assessment method to use? Is it open recall or list based? To answer this question, and with financial support from the German Federal Ministry of Food and Agriculture, we managed to get some funds to enable us to conduct a research project in three countries, namely Cambodia, Ethiopia, and Zambia. Two of our national partners are here with us to share some aspects of this work later on. I, I would like to also share with everybody that the results of our research were published last July in the journal Nutrients, and we, ex and we are looking forward to more publications coming out of this work. Next slide, please. Next slide. So what are our main objectives? So um, we wanted to fill um, the research gap in MDDW data collection. Particularly, we wanted to investigate the completeness and accuracy of the two non-quantitative methods of MDDW data collection, namely open recall and list-based method. And we also wanted to identify the best approach for operationalizing the minimum quantity of 15 grams uh, of 15 grams. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, uh, this shows the design of the project. So we adopted a non-inferiority design and uh, it shows more, uh, it shows how we did it. So the first day is usually the weight food record, which in this case serve as our reference method. And women were then randomly allocated in day two for either list-based recall followed by open recall or, or, um, Conversely, open recall then list based. There was sufficient time gap between the administration of the two proxy methods to minimize recall bias. Dietary intake data from non pregnant women of reproductive age in Cambodia totaled 430, for Ethiopia 431, and Zambia 476, bringing the total number of women to 1,337. Next slide, please. Clean data were then pulled and analyzed using this statistical test. Uh, by the way, we have uh, Dr. Carl, no? the, chat, the team leader responsible for the global data analysis, and I'm sure he will be able to answer any questions on the statistical component of our work. So uh, for the dichotomous indicator, we uh, use McNamara chi-square test, Kohan Scapa, and, and rock analysis for the food, uh, for the ordinal food group food group diversity score. We use Wilcoxon match pair signed rank tests, uh, ICC and the weighted kappa, and for the individual food groups, confusion matrices. Next slide, please. So what are the key findings of this research? Um, our results show that uh, list-based and open recall overreported MDDW by 16 and 10 percentage points when compared with uh, weighed food record. The, in, uh, the ICC intraclass correlation coefficients and the kappa value indicated moderate agreement between um, LB or uh, uh, open base against the weight food record. Uh, moderate agreement values is around uh, 0.61 to 0 0.80. Next slide, please. Our um, study provides uh, statistical evidence for over-reporting of both list-based and open record methods for assessing the prevalence of MDDW or ordinal food group diversity scores in women of reproductive age in low middle income countries. Um, our individual MDD, 
Um, I'm sorry, can you go back to the previous slide? Okay. Uh, okay, uh, next slide, please. Our individual MDDW food group confusion matrices indicated that for the least base recall, 69% of type 1 errors, meaning false positives, arose from overreporting of beans and peas, dark green leafy vegetables, vitamin A rich fruits and vegetables, and other fruit uh, and other fruits food groups. Whereas around 31% of type 2 errors, meaning false negatives, were from underreporting of vitamin A rich fruits and vegetables. In parallel to open recall, 68% of type 1 errors came from overreporting of beans and peas, dark green leafy vegetables, vitamin A rich fruits and vegetables, and other fruit food groups. Whereas 32% um, of type 2 errors were from underreporting of vitamin uh, A rich fruits and vegetables. Next slide, please. Uh, though there were also misreporting of some food groups such as nuts and seeds, which were counted, but in fact were consumed in amounts less than 15 grams. And I think later on we will hear more of this from probably from uh, Pamela, and uh, which in fact, uh, because they are not consumed um, in the minimum amount of 15 grams, they, they should go into condiments and seasonings. While we did not delve deep uh, deeper into the causes, it is likely that memory lapses, uh, social desirability and or social approval, such as consumption of animal source foods, influence the responses. Thank you. Over to you, Isabella. Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you, Maria Antonia. Uh, we, who we call Piche, and thank you, Riley. Um, I'll uh, briefly uh, present to you the preparation and development of food lists. So, as Maria Antonia presented now, our, our FAO Muti country study provided important insights on the choice of data collection methods for MDDW that were discussed and analyzed among our technical advisory group in order to provide FAO recommendations. This study was our main source of information, but we analyzed its results also in light of our partners' experiences with collecting MDDW, because fortunately, FAO is not the only organization experienced with data collection for MDDW. So the food list preparation and development good practices that I'll briefly present now, and you will find in, details in, the, in details in the upcoming um, updated MDDW file guide is a result of a diverse range of consultations. So we thank our partners also for um, making available their experience and their data. And we aim at aligning our learnings to come up with the good practices for data collection methods based also on WHO, UNICEF, minimum dietary diversity for children, indicator on the infant and young children feeding practices indicator, which is an upcoming publication. The demographic and health survey program, DHS, who is now also collecting MDDW for a large number of countries and has been performing uh, interesting studies on the best way of asking questions and the adaptation of questionnaires for MDDW. And Gallup World Poll, specifically the Global Diet Quality Questionnaire, who has also performed cognitive interviews and formative research, is also collecting MDDW and has shared uh, their learnings with us. And we, after a lot of discussions, we came up with these recommendations. Next, please. So our study's findings show that both data collection methods are valid and useful according to different contexts. Um, as long as the best practices are followed during survey planning and data collection, and also results using the same methodology are compared, both methods will remain useful in demonstrating changes in dietary diversity trends over time and between population. Because uh, quantitative uh, data collection methods are still highly uh, unlikely to be used in so widely because of it being resource intensive. 
So the first step, regardless of the choice of method for data collection, be it list-based method or open recall, is to develop an extensive food list with local food items categorized into each food group. The locally adapted extensive food list is needed for both methods. Next, please. So here we have the starting points for food lists, which are the 10 food groups for MDDW. Um, these are generic food groups that were grouped according to nutritional content, but mostly culinary use also, uh, not botanical. And they, they compose the, the diverse diet, the diverse diet for women. Uh, but for each country or each region or community, uh, these food groups will contain food items that are representative of the local diets. So hardly one food list is, a, is usable for other country or for other regions. So the adapting of the food list, it's a very important uh, step, the first step. So data collection tools must reflect the local food and dietary habits of target population. Um, so preparing a culturally and linguistic adapted MDW questionnaire uh, is needed um, in terms of geography, population, food culture, uh, agroecological zones. This all will influence the type of also seasonality, will influence which food items should be mentioned in each food group. Um, next, please. So the process of localizing the food list uh, can, can have some useful information and then this information should be collected if available. Uh, for example, food consumption data from previous local surveys, this is very important if available, especially if the country has uh, quantitative data, this is very useful, but uh, a lot of countries will not uh, be so lucky to have um, so in that sense, the focus group discussions with local experts and key informants interview is very important to identify these food items. Um, also, national or regional food composition tables or laboratory data. This is specifically if you need to, to determine if a local food is vitamin, rich, uh, vitamin A rich. Uh, you would need this, otherwise this is not so relevant. Um, but also foods, uh, seasonal foods calendar can be very useful knowing which foods are available in different seasons and other relevant data. All of this to, to identify the most commonly consumed food items for each food group. Next, please. So here we, we have this scheme to show how from the extensive food list, meaning that the survey team should come up with as, much, as many examples as possible to put all the foods available in that region or in that country into the correct food group. So this is the first tool, what we are calling the extensive food list that is used both for list based and open recall. What will change is that if the choice of method, so also in the guides, as Alex will present later, uh, there's also uh, explaining uh, who, how to choose this, this uh, method if, you, if for your survey the list base is more appropriate or the open recall. Um, so after this decision, if you choose list base, what will change after the step of developing the food list is that for the preparation of the questionnaire itself, it will be, it will have the step of selection of most frequently consumed food items per food group. We will not be such an extensive food list anymore because the objective is to reduce respondent burden and then obtain a shorter, uh, shorter questions with limited number of food items mentioned by food group. This means that the length of food list is uh, shorter. So that's what we're calling sentinel food items, meaning uh, up to seven examples. So ideally seven or fewer food items mentioned per row. And this, as I mentioned in the first slide, is aligned with our partners also choice of method. On the other, on the other hand, for open recall, with the extensive food list, the, the preparation of the questionnaire is the use of an open grid stru structure to openly record food items, plus uh, the extensive food list where the enumerator will record 
uh, the answers, but we'll not read the extensive food list to the respondents. So the length of food list continues the same. The extensive food list is kept. Next, please. So as I explained, the interview protocol is different and for list base, um, the respondent is asked to take a few minutes to mentally recall her pre previous day and nights and her food consumption. And the food list is read to the respondent who is asked to answer yes or no for each food group consumed on the previous day or night. That's why the respondent burden is concerned when we are talking about the number of examples per role. So this is a big uh, difference from the, the open recall. And then the enumerator will mark the responses directly on the list. While on open recall, uh, the respondent is asked to openly report in chronologic, chronological order the food items consumed in the previous day or night. And then the enumerator will register in the open grid and then mark on the list. So uh, this is described in much more details and with all the references we used in the upcoming guide as Alexandra will present. And this is uh, one of the biggest challenges for survey teams who happen not to have a previous developed food list in their countries or not having nutrition surveys. Some other countries might be uh, luckier and have more tools available or even having DHS or Gallup World Poll having um, a list, a locally adapted list available. But for surveys, the survey team who don't have, will have this big challenge. But this is not the only challenge. Uh, another challenge is also the mixed dishes and that's what Pamela will present now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Isabella. So uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, I'll be talking about how we adapted um, our survey and here in Zambia to deal with the challenge of uh, mixed dishes. Uh, next slide, please. So now in many cultures, uh, mixed dishes with different ingredients are common and present a challenge to MDDW data collection. So when you're collecting data, even from one country, um, you might experience a challenge whereby people are from different ethnic communities, but residing in this, that same country. But even if you're only focusing at uh, a specific region in that particular country, you might find that people people living in that region are from different ethnic communities and they have very different uh, mixed dishes that they consume. And they also have different um, uh, food habits and uh, food cultures. So uh, identifying ingredients um, that are commonly consumed in less than 15 uh, grams can be a challenge uh, because this can change by household habits. Uh, for example, we have instances whereby family dish may be cooked in one family pot, but then at the time of uh, consuming the dish, probably it's served on, in one dish and several members of the household may consume from the same dish. So this is a common a practice in Africa. And uh, in some cases you might find that the mother serves her food on a plate. And then you have the little children that maybe that, that are less than five years old, consuming from the same plate with the mother. So it becomes very difficult to know how much of the food that was served on the plate was actually consumed by the mother and how much was consumed by the children. And uh, if it's a mixed dish, it even, it even becomes more complicated. And then we also realize that food cultures uh, may differ from uh, uh, one ethnic group to the other. And even within different households, uh, the food cultures may, may differ. And this might have an influence on how the mixed dishes are prepared uh, in these uh, different households. And uh, the other important point to take note of is that uh, the economic situation within a household plays a significant role uh, with regards to the quantities of ingredients that go into the mixed dish and even the quality and even the number of ingredients that go into that dish. Uh, for example, households that may be economically uh, better off 
I might use some ingredients more, maybe larger quantities of some ingredients than, than families that uh, maybe households that uh, are poorer. So they might use some ingredients uh, sparingly, but then for the same uh, uh, dish, which has maybe the same name, but then when you look at the two dishes, the quantities of ingredients used might actually uh, be different. And so this can actually be a challenge. Uh, so uh, during the MDD study that we conducted in Zambia, uh, we had to deal with this um, and uh, especially by first developing the food list, uh, which was very important for the study, um, uh, for, for the least best recall method and also for the open recall method. And um, we proceeded by first identifying the common locally uh, consumed mixed dishes so the research team, first of all, developed a list of commonly consumed mixed dishes because uh, the team uh, was local. And uh, after that, we consulted with the local nutritionists. At national level, we consulted with the Food and Nutrition Commun uh, Commission here in Zambia. And we also consulted the nutritionists from the Ministry of Agriculture, that is at the national level. And then we went down to the district level uh, to the region where we are collecting data from. And we engaged with the nutritionists from the Ministry of Agriculture district level, as well as the nutritionists at the district health office uh, in Chongwe, uh, which was the study site. So after developing this uh, comprehensive uh, list of local mixed dishes, we then also obtained uh, common recipes for ingredients and quantities uh, for the commonly consumed mixed dishes. And so we realized that the variations in the way people develop uh, or cook their, their mixed dishes, but then we had to come up with kind of a, some standard uh, recipes for the main mixed dishes that are commonly consumed. And uh, during capacity development, Enumerators were taken uh, through this mixed uh, dishes approach, uh, whereby they had to correctly classify mixed dishes into the main food groups based on the main ingredients that were in the mixed dishes. But of course, we had this, the ingredients that were used in very, very small quantities. So we also took note of, took note of that. And then during the training, we also had the chance to do a visual demonstration of how the 15 grams of each ingredient that is used in small quantity would look like. So then the, uh, the enumerators were able to appreciate what 15 grams, let's say, of um, rosemary would look like, how 15 grams of a tomato would look like, or 15 grams of groundnut powder, which is a commonly used ingredient uh, here in Zambia, would look like. Um, next slide, please. Uh, one important aspect that we emphasized to the enumerators during the training was the fact that they needed to count the foods as food groups, not as individual foods. So I'll give you an example. We had instances whereby some foods may be consumed in small quantities in the course of the day, but then these foods belong to the same food group. So on the slide, you can see we have uh, an example of cucumber, tomato, and eggplant, which belong to the same food group, but which might have been consumed in small amounts, under 15 grams throughout the day. But then when you take the total intake and add it, then it will be more than 15 grams. Another example would be like groundnuts, which is also commonly consumed. So you find that groundnuts and some sesame seeds might be consumed in very small amounts as snacks in the course of the day. But then when you add up the amounts that have been consumed, they will be more than 15 grams and therefore they'll count towards that food group. Pre-testing of the data collection um, uh, tools uh, was very important in this study because it provided some insights to how we could improve the mixed dishes approach. So we were able to identify some of the challenges uh, that uh, numerators were likely to face during the main study. And then uh, we went through all those challenges and um, how to deal with each of them. Next slide, please. So some of the frequently encountered challenges uh, included uh, the following. So we had um, 
some respondents having uh, mixed foods or mixed dishes that had not been prepared at home. So for instance, foods that had been bought outside the home from fast food restaurants or simply um, supermarkets. We have a lot of supermarkets here where you can actually buy uh, cooked food and just take it home. And the respondents, other than just knowing the main ingredient in the, in the, the mixed dish, they wouldn't know the other ingredients that had been used in that particular mix dish. So that was a challenge. And uh, in some instances, we had enumerators not being sure of the probing practice, especially when this respondent does not mention the usual ingredient of a mixed dish. So let me give you an example. So we have a vegetable dish, mixed dish called a visashi. And visashi is a vegetable dish. Uh, so you have the green vegetables, it could be the, the groundnut, uh, um, not uh, the pumpkin, sorry, the pumpkin leaves. It's called chihuahua. So, and it's commonly cooked with a tomato and onion, and then you can add cooking oil, salt, and then you add a good amount of um, groundnut powder or groundnut paste. And this groundnut paste can also be added to other dishes. So let me, using this example of the sashi, and then a uh, respondent would say, I had the sashi maybe yesterday, but then when, when you, the enumerator is trying to probe what, what was in the visashi, the respondent doesn't mention the groundnut powder. And yet the enumerator knows that groundnut powder is one of the key ingredients that needs to go into the visashi for that mixed dish to be called visashi. So the enumerators were unsure whether they needed to give a hint to the respondent or how to go about it to ensure that uh, the, res the respondent then mentions the, the ingredient that actually went uh, in that uh, mixed dish. And we had uh, several other uh, examples uh, where they, they were a little bit confused on the probing practice. And then there was also confusion on categorization of mixed uh, fresh fruit juice versus processed uh, fruit drink of fruit juice. So it's very common here in Zambia for um, households to probably uh, buy uh, processed fruit drink. But then when they're asked what they consume, they'll be like, oh, I consumed fruit juice. <laughs> because for them, it, that's fruit juice. So uh, we the enumerators were then taken through uh, how to probe and get to know whether it was actually fresh fruit juice made at home or bought from um, maybe a restaurant, but was actually fresh fruit juice, or whether it was just processed, a processed drink or processed um, a fruit uh, juice. And another example is whereby um, a mother would say, I consumed tea with milk or, or coffee with milk. Uh, but then uh, they were confusing uh, coffee creamers with uh, milk. So they'll say, I consumed coffee with milk or tea with milk, but what they actually consumed was coffee with the coffee creamer or tea with the creamer. So then it was important for the, the numerator to kind of probe and just find out that milk, the brand, because um, then they'll tell them the brand of the milk. Then if they said it was Pamalat milk or if it was clover milk, then they'll know, okay, that was milk. But the moment they said, okay, it was a cremora, then they knew, okay, that was not, that is a crema. So then they would classify uh, the food uh, uh, items uh, correctly. So those are just some few examples of some of the challenges that we encountered. And we went through this with the enumer enumerators uh, for them to know exactly how they needed to go about it during the main data collection exercise. Next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, what are some of the tech home messages for practical application? for field data collection from this MDDW study. So very important is to consult uh, local nutrition experts when preparing the food list, um, simply because uh, you, may, you, 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 you may be a nutrition expert, but most of the time you are not always in the field, interacting with the local people. And, and since we do research work in different countries, you may not be familiar with all the mixed dishes that are 
cooked or prepared in those particular countries. So it's very, very important, even if you have some knowledge of some mixed dishes that are consumed, engage the nutrition ex local nutrition experts for them to support the research team in coming up with an extensive um, list, uh, food list, and also to identify the mixed dishes. And it's also very important to have, uh, to do some quantity estimation of ingredients that are used in uh, small quantities. And this can be done in advance. Um, and, and this information can be used during the capacity development or during the training of the numerators. And uh, get to know uh, the recipes for mixed dishes. Um, so in some countries, you can have standard, standard recipes, but um, in many developing countries, uh, you, some of these mixed dishes may not actually be documented. And even if they're documented, different households vary the way they make these uh, dishes. So the way one household would make it would be very different from the way the other household uh, would, would prepare the same dish. And uh, it's important for the research team also just to take time to, to determine the weights of some of the common foods and even some of the ingredients in advance. And in this particular MDW study in Zambia, what we did was that in the food and nutrition science uh, kitchen, for some of the dishes where there were no standardized uh, recipes, we actually had to do it practically in the lab and determine in advance what ingredients would go in uh, with the help of the, the local, um, people within the department. And then during the training, we were able then to pass on this knowledge to the numerators and also just having a visual demonstration of how a 15, 15 grams of an ingredient would look like or um, um, a food item would look like was very important. Um, and it, this is important even for the numerators. And I would like just to add that, um, for you to do this very well, you need also to have enumerators that are knowledgeable about the local conditions and also about the local uh, food uh, habits. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, and adequate training of enumerators is key to collection of quality data. Uh, for the research team in Zambia, we had enumerators that had diploma level and BSc level qualification. Yeah, so like those that have BSc level and diploma level nutrition knowledge, but they haven't yet gotten jobs. And some of them are already working, but they were able to get uh, some time off to come and support our team during uh, uh, this study. And during the training, we correctly classified foods into the different food groups. And given that the enumerators had some background knowledge of nutrition, it was, it was a lot easier for us to classify uh, the foods with them. But of course, we had situations whereby a few of them would confuse where certain foods would go. Uh, yeah, but then we, with the adequate training that was uh, rectified and uh, they were supported, um, they had, had enough time to support them through the training period. And uh, we emphasize the need to ask for ingredients uh, used in mixed dishes. So we kept emphasizing to the enumerators, please during data collection, you need to keep asking for the ingredients that are in the mixed dish. And uh, for the 24 hour recall, for instance, they had like, once they say what food, I food mixed dish they had consumed, then they would uh, indicate the, the ingredients that are in the dish. And then the numerator would then go over the dishes and then probe whether there was any other thing that was added to that mixed dish. Yeah. And then lastly, we also emphasize the need, the probing technique to be used. Uh, we, we requested the numerators never to mention the foods by name, but instead use phrases such as, was there anything else you ate? Because when you mention a food, it's kind of, you're giving the respondent an idea that, oh, they needed to actually eat this particular uh, food item. Yeah. And um, IT support is also very critical um, uh, when doing this um, MDDW study, especially if you're using uh, uh, the, the digital tools and you need to have a dedicated IT personnel uh, on the ground with the team, which we were lucky to have. So this IT personnel 
can support the research team during our training on, on how to use the, the tablets. For example, we were using ODK, creating Excel forms. They can help with the quality checks and uh, they can also help with data cleaning, especially for the open recall uh, method. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Okay. Morning and good afternoon, everyone. This is Delaso from Ethiopian Public Health Institute. Thank you, FAO, for creating this uh, platform to share our experience and knowledge in the area of MDDW data collection. Next slide, please. So since uh, the MDDW indicators are, uh, we're trying to in, in integrate or incorporate in the national surveys like DHS and other nutrition surveys. So we want to also test the applicability of uh, uh, MDDW in the electronic data collection since most electronic devices are using the IT information. So copy or computer assisted uh, personal interview means it is collecting data using a handle device like mobile phone or small tablets or <coughs> laptops. Next, please. And this would uh, help us to, uh, to replace the pen and paper data collection using the electronic uh, data collection. So most digital device has a capacity that has inbuilt data checks, uh, easy data transfer. Often we collect the data, we have been using the internet, but in the middle of the data collection, we had a chance to interrupt it uh, during the internet blackout in the country and we used or explored the other option like uh, transferring data through Bluetooth and cable. So since this electronic device has many options to transmit data to other uh, storage, so uh, we can use. And uh, the, such kind of data collection also has the, the, the potential to, to capture ancillary information such as videos, voices, photos, and uh, can also capture the GPS information of the household or the respondent to, uh, to collect information over a uh, time, but also it saves resources and it also reduces effort to produce a clean data set since it has a quality data check inbuilt in the system. Next, please. And it helps us to improve the quality of data by regularly visiting while the data transmitted or transferred to the repository server. Next, please. Next, please. Can you hear me? Okay, copy mainly requires the uh, trained IT personnel for programming and uh, power to powering or uh, energize the tablets and power bank uh, to, to avoid any uh, battery run out during data collection uh, and to protect the tablets with uh, the screen protection, connectivity and uh, server for uploading the data for regular basis. And it's also uh... Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, some of the characteristics of these data collections like uh, using the ODK or the uh, electronic data collection system for the open and recall, it is very easy and user-friendly to collect both open and recall methods. 
and the data collectors were very confident to collect data with a minimal training and uh, both open and list based data collection uh, it, it uh, can last the same number of uh, households to visit per day uh, but uh, the open record since the nature of the data presentation in the tablet is a bit different from the list based since it requires to record all the food they the, the respondent consume from the morning to uh, until she go to sleep so it has uh, minimal data coding and cleaning, but in the list base, it, is, it was a straightforward as a yes or uh, no response for each food group she consume. And uh, open recall, it, it uh, depend based on the nature of the data collection platform, it requires some small uh, multiple passes to, to double check or to confirm the amount and the type of food she consumes. So this is what uh, uh, I share with you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, OK, so um, I will present on the updated uh, FAO MDDW guide, um, which is going to be published by the end of this year. Can you go to the next slide, please? As um, users of MDDW already know that the first version of the guide was published in 2016. And uh, since then, as Pichai already mentioned um, in, her, in her presentation, that there have been many new developments, um, many more countries collecting MDDW and using it for different purposes. So this and the questions that came from the users and um, the need to harmonize the methodologies, all of these um, contributed to the decision of um, coming with up with the updated version of the guide. And in addition to this, uh, can I go to the next slide, please? Um, as mentioned, so there is the recent scientific evidence, which was presented earlier, the results from the FAO study that was done in Cambodia, Ethiopia, and Zambia, and um, also the collection, the incorporation of MDDW and DHS, and um, as well as the update of the IYCF guide. And so we have, con we have consulted all of these state different stakeholders, users, uh, experts, including um, those, of course, the authors of the first version of the guide and um, all the co all colleagues within FAO that uh, may use this uh, indicator, as well as the organizations that Peter has mentioned, WFP, EFED, GIZ, Bioversity, and that are actively using this indicator. And we also ask for feedback from uh, users um, through some workshops that we've had in the past couple of years together with the EU and also our listserv on MDDW. Um, we can also share the link for this later in case you're interested um, to get this information. And also the recent meetings that we organized together with GIZ in the EU, um, a series of three technical meetings um, on uh, MDDW. So um, based on this, we have decided to update the guide and this is um, the content in the new guide. Next slide, please. So what's in the updated guide? So the previous guide um, had, had also already some of this information, but we have, did, we have organized it in a way that could be more user friendly and also with additional clarifications that users have been asking for. So part one of the guide is, uh, has a technical, more of a technical focus um, that is um, giving you the background, the theory, the overview of the indicator, definition, the construction, and then the step-by-step -step instructions on how to choose which method to use, as we mentioned, the open recall and the list-based, and um, what based on the resources, your survey needs, and also some example tools and also on the food groups, we have given more emphasis also on some of the optional food groups that are particularly related to NCDs as this was also in response to 
um, the queries of many users and aligning with DHS and IYCF. And also then more examples, new examples on how to analyze and present and interpret the data and um, for um, different purposes. And um, this is also a new chapter, um, chapter five on what, um, how to apply the data in different uh, settings, including for setting targets for um, program evaluation. And the second part of the guide would be more um, field management operation oriented, which is uh, preparing how to collect, how to prepare to um, collect um, MVW data, which is most useful for first time users, because if you're a part of a larger survey, maybe you already have your own protocol and MVW is just part of it. So, but if you're doing a standalone survey or you're not familiar with the um, Pro process of setting up the data collection for MDDW in the country, this could be quite useful. And then also um, how to select the enumerators and how to train them for each of the methods. And um, to make the guide more user-friendly, we will also come up with some supplementary materials such as uh, individual slide decks and also a policy brief uh, summarizing the information in the guide. Next slide, please. And so these are some of the intended users for the guide, um, which uh, I'm sure you, you see yourself here. And um, the practitioners, which are the survey managers, technical personnel, nutritionists who are collecting the, who are doing the hands-on collection of the data. And this will help um, using a standardized methodology to um, collect the data in different situations and also for researchers which are conducting more in-depth studies using MDW in um, different fields. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, finally, then also for decision makers, um, in, in addition to technical content on the step-by-step -step data collection and analysis instructions, um, we also have information on how to apply the data, which would, we hope will help promote the dialogue of using MDDW more as a foot-based indicator in a national information systems to monitor and evaluation of, of nutrition progress and hopefully eventually for SDG2 and also to apply the data in informing the formulation of nutrition sensitive policies and programs. Um, that's it from my side. Thank you. Okay, so it's time for questions and answers. My name is uh, Karla Shan. I will try to help you to structure this process a little bit. Thank you for all those that have submitted questions and comments in the Q&A box, as Riley was putting in the, in the chat box again. Please, if you have any comments, encouragements, uh, or questions, put them in the Q&A session. That way we can handle the comments and we'll be able to get back to you as soon as possible. Um, I also want to direct you to the answered questions because there are already, already some questions that were answered on the 15 gram cutoff and how it is used for which food groups and how it's operationalized at a daily level that may require your attention. So have a look there. The responses are very useful and may uh, already address some of the questions you have. Uh, but for now, I have uh, two questions that I would direct to, to Pamela. Um, a first question comes from uh, John and he wonders, uh, Pamela, were you carrying scales to the field or samples of food already weighed? Uh, so that is a first question. And the second question uh, was, answer, was uh, put there by Andrea. In this situation, you mentioned where a respondent reporting eating a mixed dish, but did not mention eating a key ingredient of that mixed dis dish. What did instruct? What did you instruct enumerators to do? So, uh, Pamela, could you uh, clarify those questions? Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, John and Andrea, for your questions. So, starting with John's uh, question, um, I need to clarify that. Um, for the open recall and the list best, we did not weigh any ingredients. So 
Uh, what I, I was trying to explain uh, during my presentation was that uh, during, uh, during the training, uh, it was important for us to estimate, for example, what, how much, let's say, a tomato would weigh, how much a tomato would weigh, or how much an onion, a medium-sized onion would weigh, so that when you're in the field and the woman says, I used four tomatoes of, or, or two onions in this mixed dish, then you would, the enumerator would quickly say, okay, one medium-sized tomato is this weight. So we established that the one medium-sized uh, tomato, for example, was uh, between 80, 80 to 120 grams, depending. And then the onion was also in the same range. Yeah, so it would have been, it, would, it was going to be easier for the enumerator to kind of estimate uh, if the, the woman says she used uh, four tomatoes, for example. So already it's four times eight, so they can have a rough idea that, okay, so this is already 360 grams of tomato in this particular dish that was used in this particular dish. But in the African context, um, food is, we don't, we have large families and food is cooked in one big pot. And so this pot, these four tomatoes or five tomatoes could have gone into this big uh, pot. And therefore, very important, it was also for the numerator then to have an idea like how many people actually consume this food. But uh, again, I need to mention to John that the research team, as was mentioned by Pichai at the very beginning, the methodology was that on day one, they do wait food record and then for the weight food record they needed to have scales with them and then on day two those that were doing the open uh, recall and the list best were not covering scales with them so on day two uh, we were not weighing any food but just using the methodology for the open recall uh, or the uh, 24 recall and the list best yes and uh, the other question was on hmm Carl, please. Yes. Yeah, so the other question was in this. So this was a question by Andrea. In a situation okay. you mentioned where a respondent reported eating a mixed dish, but did not mention eating a key ingredient of that mixed dish, what did you instruct okay. the enumerators to do? Okay. So thank you. So Andrea, um, this was a challenge that we experienced uh, during. Um, the pilot, a pretest, a pretest of the study, and what we we told the enumerators to do, we, we actually told them they need to keep probing, go over the dishes again, say okay, so you ate this and this and this. So what else did you eat and what else? But sometimes it was memory lapse and they couldn't remember. But then if it was really a main, a main, a main ingredient, they would remember without the enumerator actually. Um, uh, even hinting to them, uh, yeah. But of course, if they had forgotten something that is used in very small quantity and maybe not commonly used in a mixed dish, then it was unfortunate because then that information was not picked. But we told the enumerator to keep uh, probing for what else was added. And, uh, and so this uh, challenge was experienced during the pretest. And so we went over the, all the challenges that were experienced to, during the pretest. And so during the data collection, we kept checking on the numerators to see how they were doing. And uh, they, they, they seem to be doing well. So we didn't experience a lot of this uh, during the, uh, the main uh, data collection exercise. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Pamela. And the next question that I want to pick up is uh, the one from uh, Murat Mursi, uh, which is directed to, to Dilna So. so Please, Dilna, so uh, can you clarify a little bit what you meant with data cleaning and coding after the open recall uh, method was collecting using the copy? Could you give some examples, perhaps? Dilna, so are you still there? Maybe you're muted. Okay, and um, we have lost Dilna, so perhaps I will move. So if you don't mind, Murat, I will uh, probably pick up May this question again. Uh, yes? May I maybe step? Yes, please, back? you can also clarify. Okay, so um, from our Zambian experience, um, 
for the IT person was helping the data cleaning. So what happened for the open, um, the open uh, recall? So the, numerate, the respondent mentioned the foods that were consumed in chronological order as presented by um, Isabella. And so they would type out, sometimes type out those foods. And so we had all to agree that they use certain format. So either if it's tomato, so some would type in tomatoes, others tomato. And then there were all these, uh, sometimes they would type in wrong spelling, uh, not intentionally, but maybe because they're just doing it very quickly. Yeah, so, so, for, so now what would happen is that we, during the training, we actually agreed on the format to use. And then sometimes the food would pop up, but in case the food didn't pop up, you, they had to type out. And so therefore during data cleaning, the IT personnel had to try and ensure that all the names of foods were, uh, were in a certain order so that they can be classified together. And then, uh, so like tomato, sometimes we had buns, bread being misspelled. So buns with B-U-N, others B-A-R-N, yes, you know, such like. And uh, so just, so that was the data cleaning that had to be done for the open recall because of the typing of the real, the actual foods that were consumed. Uh, and then for the coding, so after the cleaning had been done, so the, the, the woman of reproductive age then con had consumed foods from different uh, groups, but then we needed to classify these foods into the 10 main food groups. So then you'd bring, if they consume tomato, onion, so th those were given certain codes and then they would fall under one food group. And then if they consume sesame seeds or pumpkin seeds or groundnuts, then those would be in another, uh, given a certain code. And we did that for all the food groups, uh, the different foods belonging to the different food groups, yeah, for the coding part, yeah. Okay, thank you. Dilsa, if you are there and if you want to add something, please go ahead. If not, I will move to the next question. Yeah, I think she, she well explained. Okay, thank you. Good to know you're still there. Um, yeah. I have a, yes, please. Okay, so I'll move to the next question, which I would direct to the to the FAO team. Um, for From an anonymous uh, attendee uh, who has collected data um, using the 2016 guidelines, and he or she wonders if the 2020 guidelines will impact the results. Um, so does that person need to reanalyze? Is, is there anything that needs to be changed after the new guidelines? Maybe some of the FAO Rome team can answer, Alexandra, Isabella, or Piche. Um, okay, this is Isabella. Um, no, it will not need to reanalyze uh, the, the core of the indicator is still the same. What we are recommending is um, improvements and citing new uh, evidence on how to develop a, a, a well-developed questionnaire, how to reduce this type of bias of overestimation that we found in our study but the indicator is still, still the same. There is some news, but I, I don't think it will affect your data analysis. I don't know if PJ or Alex want to, to make a comment on this, but um, that's from my side. Well, uh, I, I think, uh, yeah, that's correct. Uh, we do not really see any um, major um, change in terms of the results coming from the use of the 2016 um, uh, guidelines. Uh, but what uh, I think one of the things that we want to flag is if you did your study on a particular season, then it may not really capture the, uh, the, um, uh, the, in, the, the micronutrient adequacy of this particular group you know, throughout the year. So I, I, I mean, um, it, it may be useful, uh, not really reanalyze, but uh, probably um, up um, updating the data that you have collected in case 
uh, it was done on a particular season because it made this uh, this issue of seasonality has come up one time and again in terms of the uh, validity you know, of the MDDW information. But just like what Isabella had mentioned, in so far as uh, using the, um, the application of the methodology, then uh, it's not really going to uh, to make that much of a difference. But if you want to, I, I don't know which method you use, but then if you like, for instance, to be able to compare it with other, uh, with data from other countries that may be using a different methodology, then obviously uh, that is something for you to consider as well. Okay, thank you. Piche, while I have you on the line, there is a question of Jennifer that requires your attention. But after that question, I want to get maybe the feedback of Alex, because there's an interesting discussion uh, related to questions of Anne Swindale related to the 15 gram, which I think deserves a group uh, response. So uh, Alex, I will come to you in a minute. Perhaps okay. you can prepare your answers to the questions of Anne Swindale. But the question I want to ask to, uh, to address by Piche is, what is the significance of, of the overestimation of the two methods uh, for the field in terms of health or results reporting at subnational level? Should we really be worried? This seems to be an, a substantial overestimation. How concerned should we be about using these methods? How do you determine the cost benefit in terms of accuracy versus ease of data collection? Perhaps if you can answer the question of Jennifer Piche. Well, uh, that's, uh, that's a very good uh, question, no? Um, and unfortunately, uh, the study was uh, the study that we made was really looking into the um, accuracy of the information um, uh, compared to a reference method. Okay, uh, there was uh, we did not look into uh, any association with these results with any functional outcome or any health outcome. No, so it would be a little bit. Um, difficult to say that um, um, an overestimation of let's say 16% for I think it's if I'm not mistaken that one the, the higher overestimation is with the least based method that that overestimation is associated with you know with a significant difference in terms of a particular health outcome or micronutrient status so um, I don't think uh, we, uh, well, uh, I think this is one of the areas that we want to look into the future, but um, the issue of whether, uh, just how significant are this over-reporting um, is something that we have not really looked into. And um, yeah, so I, yeah. I don't know if that answered your question. This is Isabella, if I can also add to this. Yeah. Um, um, so uh, the overestimation observed, uh, we looked into the, the source of the overestimation. So um, what we are also uh, recommending in the guide is the well-developed um, questionnaire. So some changes that we made to the questionnaire, be it the least base or open recall, aims at addressing this overestimation. So hopefully this can be further reduced with the good practices. Um, but also the, the, we have to consider that the quantitative data collection, be it weight food records, is very resource intensive. So it's a limitation uh, of the method, although it can be considered a reference method, is very unlikely that this can be collected in large scale. So for any nutrition survey, be it MDDW or, or other indicators or other uh, nutrition uh, surveys, this will be a limitation. So we believe that the step forward to validating and recommending the good practices for the non-quantitative methods is still of uh, big importance and value for public health uh, nutrition. And, and as long as you use the same methods to compare to another survey or to compare to, if you're comparing list based and throughout time that you use this base again, or open recall that you use open recall again, or even the wait for records if you have the resources to do so. As long as the, the same method is used, 
is still valid the comparison because you can still observe the uh, change over time or change among uh, or uh, differences among population. So that's what we are addressing in the guide. Thank you. Um, uh, Carl, I think one of the things that we also want to emphasize is that uh, the selection of the method hinges a lot also on the resources that are available. I think one of the reasons why the list base is favored over op open recall is because it's not as resource intensive, you know, as uh, as the other method. And for national or for large scale surveys, that really make it more attractive, no? And um, uh, I think, um, well, one of the things that we are also now looking, and I don't know if uh, people, some people here attended the web, uh, this, the seminar that we had with F, uh, with EU and GIZ. We are also now looking into the economics of collecting MDDW, and we hope that soon we will be able to provide the information on the um, just. Uh, uh, looking into yeah how much it would cost to to collect MDDW data using list based or open recall and um, and what is the return on investment no in terms of using these methodologies but uh, as I've said this is uh, something that we have not really looked uh, closely enough but we hope that in the near future this type of information will also be available over to you Karn. Okay, thank you, uh, Pichai and Isabella. I think it's indeed a good reminder that we should take care to develop good food lists, make sure we have context-specific food lists and examples where possible, and, uh, and let us uh, assess sources of bias uh, wherever possible. Um, I will come back to Alex for the question uh, raised or the discussion raised by Anne Swindell. Could you perhaps first re-summarize re a little bit the questions and then formulate the response or your, your view on, on the issues raised, Alex? Yes, so Anne has asked if the how the enumerator determines whether the portion of a mixed dish consumed by the respondent has at least 15 grams of an ingredient. Um, but um, the thing is with the MDDW um, data collection method, since it's not a quantitative method, the enumerator is not supposed to be making the decision of whether the respondent has consumed 15 grams or not on the spot. And um, this is something that should have been discussed during the survey adaptation stage where the foods that are usually consumed under 15 grams would be placed in the condiments and seasoning group. I mean, we, we have found that, uh, that, of course, there might be some discrepancies in the recipes or um, in different regions. Maybe they put different uh, amounts of, uh, ingre of uh, same ingredient into the same dish. And I think um, in, in Zambia and in Ethiopia, this also happens. And I'm sure uh, maybe Pamela or Dinosaur can add to this. But during the training and during the research that we did, we had asked the enum extra questions to the enumerators, asking them actually if they have any, if they have had any confusion on the enumerator, on whether the respondent has consumed more or less than 15 gram of an ingredient. Um, based on the questionnaire that they have available and how, the way that they ask the questions. And this did not seem to be the case. And most, it seemed to be very clear to from the results that for most enumerators that it was very clear to them whether that, they, whether that the respondent has uh, consumed an ingredient more than or less than 15 grams when they reported the food. So that it was not necessary to ask for the quantities and asking for quantities is not the aim of the MDDW tool. Um, is that clear? Um, does anyone want to add something? Okay, but perhaps on the same note, we can answer the second question or the, uh, that, that she raised. Uh, how about comparability of, of estimates resulting from from perhaps revised or, or, or different methods, open versus uh, list-based uh, recall. Do you anticipate any, any 
any challenges in harmonizing data that come from different data collection methods? Well, Carl, I, I don't see any, any challenge, no? Uh, the reason why we are moving towards uh, a sentinel food approach is really to reduce respondent um, burden, okay? But um, in fact, um, if you use the least base, uh, once they have mentioned one, um, one item that has been consumed more than 15 grams, then that uh, in fact should be, uh, should be enough. It's, it's only when, uh, like uh, Pamela, Pamela had mentioned, no, you have different in, uh, different food items that are likely to be consumed less than 15 grams. But if you add up, but if you add up um, the total food consumption, uh, the total consumption of the different food items in a particular food group in a day, it would it would total to 15 grams. So then you count. The, that particular food group. And um, also Isabella had also uh, given an additional clarification in um, on the response to Anne. Do you want to speak about that, Isabella? Yeah, no, I just want to add on the 15 grams that uh, it's expected some residual error. So let's say if uh, 5% of these foods uh, that were consumed in less than 50 grams end up being counted because it's uh, just not possible to calculate this. Um, this still does not invalidate the association between, between uh, reaching the five food groups threshold with a higher probability of micronutrient adequacy for women of reproductive age. And this is also pres present in the previous guide from 2016 that it's desirable to, to eliminate these uh, small quantities to make the association uh, stronger with micronutrient adequacy, but it does not invalidate. We aim at reducing this error, but it's not possible to eliminate. So we can only put in the good practices uh, and, and reduce as much as possible, but not totally eliminate. And uh, this is still acceptable. Okay, thank you. Uh, we still have a number of minutes left and a couple of nice questions to address. I will uh, jump back to the country, so to Zambia and, um, and Ethiopia. So Pamela and Ilna, so could you perhaps answer uh, two questions at the same time? So first of all, uh, the questions on how did you handle added sugar? So uh, Justin, <coughs> excuse me, Justin found added sugars to be added to prepared juice in some context. How are you handling this uh, foods when prepared by street foods or food from local vendors? And then a question at the same time, um, how will training materials be made available? And, and how do you suggest um, training of enumerators that do not have basic nutrition background. Perhaps the availability of training materials could also be commented on by, uh, by the FAO team. And in the meantime, have a look at, while the questions are being answered, read also the comment of Anna Herford, who, who points out a nice uh, additional um, piece of data collection and resource uh, of country ad adapted uh, list-based questionnaires over 90 countries. So have a look at the URL. It will be there for a while. It might move to the answered, but this also deserves your, your attention. So first I will go to Pamela. Could you explain how you have uh, dealt with the added sugar uh, uh, challenges and how training materials will be made available? Okay, so thank you, Carl, uh, for that question. Uh, so. So in uh, situations where the enumerator indicated that she had juice, fresh juice, so the next question would be, was it juice made from home or freshly made from home or was it bought? And then the moment they mentioned they had bought the juice, then the next question would be what brand, because sometimes it would be to be branded, but sometimes it would be juice uh, that has been bought uh, from the street and maybe there was some added uh, sugar from these fast food places and sometimes they add lots of sugar in it. And sometimes even when juice is made from home, we find that some people may add lots of sugar in the juice. So the moment they mentioned that sugar had been added, 
uh, from the in the juice. So let's say it was orange juice and lots of sugar has been added. Then it ceases to go to the main food group. So if or it doesn't go to the other fruits because oranges belong to the other fruits uh, food group. So then you wouldn't classify that uh, food fruit juice under the the the, the other fruit fruit section. In in place, would take it under the the beverages section where there are sugary, the sugary beverages. There's another, other than the 10 food groups that were presented by Isabella, we have those additional uh, foods like the, the fats and the oils, and then we have the, the sugary uh, beverages and all that, the sweets. So we wouldn't put it under the main uh, 10, one of the main 10 fruits, food groups. So as long as sugar had been added, then it was, we, didn't, we did not place it in the main food group. But in most uh, cases, uh, in, in the study site where we collected data from, it was not very common to find like fresh, freshly made juice at home. What we found a lot was the, the juice that was bought, packet juice, you know, like bought from the supermarket. And most of the time it wasn't like a really, it was processed juice. So then it, we did not classify that under, under the, the main food group, yeah. Regardless of whether it was made of, it's orange or apple. So we didn't place it under the food group where apple belongs, the other fruits, but instead we put it under the, the food group that do not belong to the 10, you know, the, the beverages, the sugars and all that, yeah. And then okay, for the materials, uh, yes, training please. materials, uh, pardon? No, sorry, yeah, go ahead so because the, we the have training a few materials, minutes left. Um, uh, sorry. Yeah. So, um, I think what I can say about the training material is that um, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization will be in a better position to inform uh, the participants uh, how they'll make the materials available, whether the, the materials will be available online. Yeah, because we have the slides with us uh, that we use during the training. And then just to address the second part of the question, how, how um, suggestions on, for training enumerators who have basic knowledge background. Yeah, so again, it's doable for people with very little knowledge of nutrition. Um, you just need um, a bit more time to orient them, to orient them through the food groups and the, pro, uh, the research protocol. Uh, so for, if you have people who have some basic knowledge of nutrition, uh, the process is a bit faster, so they get things much faster. But still, if people don't have uh, knowledge of nutrition, you can still take them through the process. And with the, if you allow enough time for training, uh, by the end of the training, it will be they'll be good to go. Yeah, thank you. Okay, then I think we've gone through all questions. Perhaps Piche, could you wrap up by saying how material will be made available from the foul end? Yes, uh, okay, thank you very much, uh, Carl. I, I just uh, uh, put in here in the chat box uh, information that um, uh, a training package will be accompanying the updated user guide. And as uh, Alex had, had mentioned by um, towards the end of December, it will go live and uh, we'll share it to, um, to, to this group through Riley, okay? And uh, I think um, also another piece of information that we want to share is uh, right for now, we are also considering um, coming up with the French version of the user guide. Um, there would be, uh, I don't know from which uh, parts of the globe, of the world people are coming from, but next year there will be a series of, uh, we hope to have a series of uh, capacity development activities. So um, uh, do keep, um, uh, we'll try to keep you posted. And as Alex had said, we have the FAO MDDW listserv. Maybe Alex can share the link and then uh, um, that would be a good way to keep posted on developments on MDDW. Over to you, Carl. Okay. Yes, thank you. I think this wraps up our question and answer sessions. We've managed to resolve all pending questions, and I will hand over back to Riley for the closing uh, session. Thank you so much, Carl. Thank you to everyone for joining today's webinar and a special thank you again to Dr. Lisha and to our speakers, Dr. Tuason, Dr. Santamini, Ms. Tong, 
Dr. Marinda, and Mr. Zerfu. A recording of the webinar is now available on the Data for Nutrition YouTube channel. Copies of the presentation and a summary of the Q&A, along with all of these helpful links and resources, will be shared in the webinar's group page in the coming weeks. Thank you so much to everyone and have a lovely day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank Everybody, you. thank you for attending. Thank you, everyone. Bye.